spit in water. Change the elevation by changing the coin. Okay. You had different sets of those? Yeah. one off just to clear the gun. Oh, wait a minute, he's already here. Yeah. Okay. Those white gloves laying on the ground. Okay. Well, that's not too bad. It's not a place in jail or a hot or something. See the first thing, the first thing you learn when you're a jet aircraft. Now lick them. So you can get it back out. You clean your ears as you put it in. They go in easier. <laughs> You know what you're going to do here in a second. I'm going to hand you this lens stock. Okay. okay. You're going to pick this lens stock up. You're going to stand back like this. Okay. And you're going to touch it right down there with the powder. Don't stuff it. Just touch it. Okay. Put the heads in. Did you get it? Yeah. 
migration of habitants across the Mississippi River into what they didn't know was Spanish territory. And then after that is finished, you're going to get an opportunity to meet Madame Chouteau herself. Okay? And she's going to uh, talk about from about 1803 when the Americans came in to the picture and reminisce back to 1764 when she first moved to the village of St. Louis. Okay? Now, before introducing Brian Bay, I want to invite everyone down to the shore of that site, which is two blocks south of here. Okay? Now, we have an 18th century French camp set up there, but more important than that, at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have our heritage auction. Okay? And that's going to be in that large tent on the shore of that site. Now, this is not a tobacco auction. Uh, so, uh, our esteemed auctioneers, auctioneers, Dewey, Cheatham, and Often, are going to uh, auction off some fine interior goods, and I think you're going to enjoy it. And uh, the auction funds next year's be open to so that. Okay, Bonnie Vega graduated from Washington University with a Bachelor's of Art and History. She earned a Master of Counselor Education at St. Louis University and is now working on a Master of Historical Theology at St. Louis University. Ms. Vega taught prehistory through AD 14 at St. Louis University High. She taught American history and counsel students at Evansville Day School. The past five years, Ms. Vega has presented a lecture series in American history. Now this series consists of 32 two-hour lectures or videos covering American history from the Native American, uh, early American, Native American settlement to the end of World War II. America's History Museum and the Hainer Public Library use these lectures as fundraisers. Ms. Vega lectures at the Missouri History Museum, including a five-part series on the Civil War, programs on George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the history of St. Louis, and the history of slavery. Ms. Vega is currently doing a, pro a program on prohibition at the Disney Museum. Without any further talk here, let's make this money better. Everybody wanted a piece of this 
New World. Uh, so in 1523, uh, was actually an Italian navigator, uh, Giovanni Veranzano, who convinced the King of France to commission an expedition to find the western route to China. Columbus had found it, so maybe the French would be able to find this western route. So he explored the eastern coast of the United States, went into uh, New York Bay, into New York Harbor, got all, uh, got all the way up to what is now Massachusetts in Narragansett Bay. I don't know what he thought he would find as a passage to China, but he thought he hadn't found it. <laughs> so he went back to France and reported on his findings. So the French did land in this area before the Spanish did, but of course, no settlement in this area. So he was the first European to discover New York City, uh, which would later become the Dutch city. Uh, but his voyage convinced the king to establish a colony somewhere in this newly discovered land. So 11 years later, in 1534, he sent Jacques Cartier uh, to see if he could find this western passage. He gave him 600 league rate to mount his expedition and to discover lands in the New World. So on his first trip in 1534, he basically stayed over around uh, uh, Newfoundland, the Green Line, in that in the day. Uh, then he went back to France, came back in 1535, and made it all the way down to what is now Montreal. Uh, and so he was the first to actually touch land in what would become New France through his voyages of exploration. On his third voyage, he came with 200 settlers to now live in New France. Uh, they included 50 convicts, uh, along with their cattle, their goats, and their pigs. But after a winter of living in the fort and being attacked by the native peoples, uh, Cartier took the remaining settlers back to France, and that was the end of any settlement for 60 years, because it was just not possible to live there. And that's basically what almost happened to Jamestown. Jamestown almost died out. There were 50 bodies left mm -hmm. uh, by the time the, the second ship arrived. So this was a, a very difficult undertaking for these people to come to the new world. But what, what I always think about these first settlers is how incredibly brave they must have been uh, and, and hardy to encounter this wilderness uh, and try and settle it so difficult to do that, uh, especially the, the French Jesuits, uh, what they had to endure when they began exploring the western part of the uh, territory. Uh, actually, the first, uh, this is a drawing of that first settlement uh, that Cartier established, just a little fort on top of the hill, but even that wasn't secure enough for them. So, uh, but during this time period, uh, the French didn't leave the New World completely. They still were fishing along the banks uh, of Newfoundland. And by 1550, uh, fishermen were drawing their catches on the shores, they were making contact with Indians, and they began taking furs back to France. So through this encounter with native peoples, this is when they began dying. Uh, when the pilgrims reached the site of Plymouth, they decided that this is the land that God had given them because it was just strewn with the bones of people. They died so quickly that they couldn't even be buried. And so their rationale was, God has killed all these people so we can have this land. That was their rationale. Uh, so, uh, so Native Americans began dying in large numbers due disease as they began encountering these European fishermen. Uh, and, they, and that's why they were as far south as, uh, as Plymouth. And that's where the name Cape Cod comes from. Because cod was the most popular fish in Europe, and they, and Europeans got almost all of their cod from the New World. That was then taken back, uh, salted for them. So uh, French fishing fleets made alliances with native peoples that became important once France began to occupy the land. And this would set the tone for the difference between British and French relationships with Indians. Uh, the French were there to make them their trading partners. 
the Americans were there to kill them. So very different relationships with native peoples. Uh, New France was inhabited at this time by Algonquin people and some sedentary Iroquois people who the Iroquois and the Algonquin were always at war with each other. And eventually the Algonquin would lose their lands and they become the Illinois. Those are an Algonquin speaking people. And that's names that we have today like Missouri. That is an Algonquin word given to the people who were in along the Missouri River. So a lot of the words that we have today are Algonquin words. Or native. Of course, they don't call themselves anything. They're always the people. Uh, and then it's another group who gives them a name. Uh, so by the 1580s, uh, French trading companies had been set up and ships were contracted to bring back furs. Eventually, the French crown decided to colonize the territory to secure and expand its influence in America. Um, the British have not arrived yet. Jamestown is not going to be until 1607. So uh, there really is no British settlement at this point in the New World. So uh, by 1600, France was the uh, most powerful nation in Europe. Uh, their population was three times larger than England at this time. And their king was Henry IV. Uh, Henry saw the advantages of establishing colonies in North America ahead of the English. Now, Queen Elizabeth is still alive at this time. Uh, and she had sent France or Francis Drake to establish a colony, which he did at Roanoke Island. But we all know that that failed, because when he came back, all the people were gone. So Henry and Elizabeth were in competition with each other at this time, trying to start colonies. But the British colony did last. Uh, so uh, what the French would do is they would offer a fur, offer a fur monopoly to people to come to the New World. That's not what the British did. So the, from the very beginning, the, the French were there to establish trade relationships with the Native Americans. Who would they get their furs from? They would have to be from them. They weren't going to go out and, and trap these animals or kill them. So the, the French knew from the very beginning that their business depended on the Native people, that they had to mark a partnership with them. Um, so the company of New France was formed. And it was the company that would, would uh, support the new settlements, not the crown. So in 1603, Henry sent uh, uh, Samuel de Champlain on another reconnaissance trip to New France. And he would explore the area for the next 32 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that state of New York, we have Lake Champlain, named after him. Uh, he found uh, Quebec in 16. Oh, so uh, now the French settlement will really begin with the arrival of Champlain. And uh, the owner of this company, of the Company of New France, was given a charter from Henry. And that's why I, the, the audacity of these European monarchs is just incredible. They have no idea what this is. No French or English king ever saw the New World. None of their ministers ever saw this. But they just gave land away to people. <laughs> oh, here, this is yours. Well, the British king will be giving the same thing away as one of his subjects. Mm -hmm. So they were just you know, giving away something that they didn't even know existed. Uh, so he said that uh, the company owned all the land north of what is now Philadelphia. That was all French territory. Well, you can see where the conflicts are going to arise. Uh, because the British and the French uh, king are giving the same land to different people. Uh, throughout this whole colonial experience. So, um, unlike the, um, oh, that's just the drawing of, of the French relying on the, the Native Americans. Um, unlike the, uh, uh, the British, there never was a large population in uh, New France. They never had the, uh, the settlement that the American colonies would have. Actually, by 1750, right before the French and Indian War begins, the, the entire population of New France, which was tremendously larger than the British colonies, was only 50,000 people. The American colonies were 1.1 million. So there never was a large French 
population in, in their colony. Um, so, um, actually, the city of Quebec is only number 400 people uh, after 50 years of colonization. Uh, so the French devised a strategy of control over this vast territory uh, that would not tax the limits of their resources. And they would rely heavily on the support of their Indian allies, uh, not only for trade, but militarily, helping them to hold this territory against the British. They didn't want to displace the Indians, as the Spanish and the English wanted to do. Uh, they didn't take their land away from they weren't interested in becoming farmers. That's not what they were there for. So they didn't care about the Native American land, uh, unlike the British colonists, that that's the only thing that they wanted was land, because they were here to farm. Uh, so uh, they came up with this idea of using their Frenchmen, uh, that they called Corps de Bois, to go out and establish relationships with the Native American people set up some kind of fur trading agreement, and then bring the furs to a certain point and then export them back to Europe. So uh, while the English colonial system destroyed as much as possible, the French supported and sustained the Indian world that they were going to live in. Uh, so while the English and Dutch colonizers confined, confined themselves just to the Atlantic coast, the French began exploring the entire interior of North America. And that's why their claims would be so much larger. Uh, a 19th century Protestant historian by the name of Francis Parkman wrote, Spanish civilization crushed the Indian, English civilization scorned and neglected him, French civilization embraced and cherished him. So this became known as what they call forest diplomacy, trade and proselytization. Uh, so, a special talent for winning, winning Indian cooperation and assistance uh, enabled just a handful of French soldiers, fur traders, and priests to retain control over this large section of North America for over 150 years. Um, <coughs> so, these corps de bois, these runners of the woods, uh, went out and to trade with Indian villages. Uh, he arranged to have these young men live with the native peoples, learn their customs. Uh, which would help the French adapt to, to life in North America. They dressed in Indian clothing, they lived in Indian houses, they spoke Indian dialects, and they married Indian women. So they were totally absorbed into the Native American culture. Uh, they extended French influence south and west to the Great Lakes. More than any other group, they would be the interface between Europe and the Native people of North America. So, alarmed by the, the British conquest of New York from the Dutch in 1664, the French king decided that he, it was not safe for the uh, territory to be under the control of the Company of France, and so he took control of Canada. He took it away from this country. So it would no longer company, it would no longer be a private commercial enterprise. It's not like the British colonies, it's a royal colony. And he sent a regiment of regular soldiers to Quebec. Uh, by 1672, uh, this is a, a map of the Fox River in Illinois up into Wisconsin, just the western coast of Lake Michigan. There were already a string of French forts in that area uh, by 1666. This is completely different than American colonization. The British did not use British troops. The French did. So the French would always be under military rule. The British colonies would not. Not until the French and Indian War would there be a British military presence in North America. Um, so they formed their own militias and their own colonies. So that was another difference between the two groups. Uh, but even by 1666, the entire population of New France was only 3,200. So it's very, very small. It's just growing by natural um, uh, processes, <laughs> <laughs> rather than people coming to New France. Yeah, and when you think about it too, when you think about the whole uh, meaning of colonization, 
you don't leave your home and your country if you're if you're successful and happy and doing well. You're not going to give that up. You leave because there's something wrong. Uh, so when the Statue of Liberty is giving you or your huddled masses yearning to be free, this is a terrible way to say it, but we kind of got the scum of Europe. That's kind of what came to America. You know, it was it was the people who had failed, who were poor, who were starving. Um, and France didn't have a lot of those people. The English did. And that's why their colonies grew so much faster. Uh, London was looking for a way desperately to get their poor out of the city. Uh, they wouldn't even send children as young as the age of six to their colonies. They would just grab them off the street and put them on a ship and send them to America. The French didn't have to do that. Uh, they were not as desperate as the English work during this time period. So the French government began, and again, I know you guys know all this stuff, began active ex exploration in the Mississippi Valley in 1673. Uh, the French heard this mighty river in the middle of the uh, country that the Algonquin people called the Mississippi. Uh, and the Algonquin word means the bottom of waters. So uh, that drained the whole central part of the continent. So in May of 1673, they sent two very unlikely men out to explore. This wasn't a military uh, expedition. Uh, it was a priest and a traitor that they sent on this military expedition. And uh, they traveled a 1,000 miles down the Mississippi River. And so they sent out Father Jean Marquette, uh, who was a 36-year-old Jesuit. Um, uh, who, had, uh, who had studied in France, and Louis Joliet, uh, who was a 27-year-old philosophy student turned perjury. Uh, so their voyage was the seed that would sprout the first white settlements where we are today, and introduce Christianity uh, to 600,000 square miles of wilderness. Uh, they would give French names to cities like New Orleans and to La Crosse. They would transform Indian cultures and lifestyles from Minnesota to Missouri. Um, and on the, the downside, really exterminate the fur-bearing mammals of the Gulf of Midwest in the process. So uh, I think this is an interesting story from uh, Marquette's diary. This is an aerial view today of the confluence of the Missouri and the Mississippi. In Algonquin, when they called it the Pecatan Deep. That's what they called the Missouri River. When uh, Marquette and Joliet reached this point, uh, they had never seen anything like this before, the confluence of two rivers that were this strong. And they said they couldn't go up the Missouri River because it was too violent. There was no way they could make that right turn to do that. And when they encountered the Missouri Indians, they came to realize why. Um, they had wooden dugout canoes. All canoes of the Eastern uh, Indians were birch bark. Well, if you had a birch bark canoe here, it would be ripped to shreds. So the only way that the Missouri could navigate this was by coming up with a new technology, the dugout canoe. Uh, so um, therefore, in, uh, in Algonquin, uh, Missouri means those who have big canoes. <laughs> That's why they named this, this uh, tribe of people the Missouri for that very reason. Uh, it wouldn't be until 1812 that Congress would begin calling this territory Missouri. It wasn't called that until 1812, about um, eight years after uh, the transfer. Um, and, and also on his map that, uh, that Marquette drew, he, he identified the two Native American groups who lived here, the Missouri up on the river, who were very, very small. Uh, by the time uh, Laclede arrives in St. Louis, the entire nation shows up in the city. And it was only 150 people. So they were very, very small. The major tribe would always be the Osage. And that's who the Chauteaus would trade with. Uh, I think it's ironic that today uh, all of the Cahokia Mounds in St. Louis have been destroyed except for one. And that one that's remaining was bought by the Osage Nation. Oklahoma. So they now own the last remaining Cahokian mountain in St. Louis. Uh, they want to try and make 
the historic site out of it. So we'll see if they're ever able to do that. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess you know. <laughs> uh, so um, they continued their voyage on down the, uh, the Mississippi River. Of course, there were no um, settlements in Missouri. In St. Louis, there never was a Native American village after the Cahokia. Uh, so he didn't see much settlement as he kept going south, that they kept going south. But finally, they got to the mouth of the uh, Arkansas River, and they determined that the Mississippi flowed into the Gulf, not into the Pacific. So really, they were going the wrong way. So at the Arkansas River, they turned back north. Uh, but the Indians that they did encounter there told them of a river that would be a shortcut back to the Great Lakes. That river today we call the Illinois River. So they said, don't keep going north on the Mississippi. Make this right turn, uh, and you'll get to Chicago much faster. That's another Algonquin word. Uh, Chicago means stinky weeds. <laughs> so I think we should call Chicago the stinky city. Not the big city. <laughs> but that's what, that's what they call because it was a swamp around there. Um, and so they call those the people the stinky weeds. Um, so they made their way back up the uh, Illinois River. Um, and their four month journey carried them more than 2,500 miles in the interior of the country. And they were the first Europeans to see that part of what would become the United States. So shortly after that, in 1699, uh, settlement was all, almost always done by uh, Catholic uh, priests, by missionaries. So in 1699, the seminary priests of the foreign missions uh, were granted the area that we, would become Cahokia. So they settled that city. Uh, of course, the Jesuits in Canada were very mad. They said, no, we deserve that because Father Marquette was the first person to go by it. But they, uh, the uh, church authorities in Canada said, no, we're going to give it to this other group of priests for them to have. Uh, so the mission was founded to convert the Tamaroa Indians. So the name of the city was the Tam Tamaroa de Haskias. So that was named after the, the tribal people who lived there. Um, a log church was built, which, as you all know, is still there today in Cahokia, um, and a mission was established. So we, Cahokia became one of the largest French colonial towns in the Illinois country at this time. Uh, it had become the center of a large area for trading Indian goods and furs. Well, the Jesuits were not satisfied to be cut out of the picture. So in 1703, they sent Father Maris, who established the first Jesuit settlement in Missouri at the mouth of uh, what is now called the River de Pere, the River of the Fathers. Uh, but they were under constant attack by uh, actually Sioux Indians who were in that area. And so in 1703, they moved across the river and founded Kaskaskia. So that became their, their Jesuit settlement. Uh, they fostered European style of agriculture with the Illini. Uh, and they introduced cattle and wheat cultivation to the area. Uh, so the 50 miles between Cahokia and Kaskaskia was uh, cultivated by uh, farming settlers known as Habitants, <laughs> uh, whose main crop was wheat. Uh, the Illinois uh, country French employed the same type of agricultural arrangements that they had uh, found in their farming villages in northern France. So they marked long ribbons of land, which the farmers did not reside on. Uh, they lived in the settlement and went out every day to farm their lands. So as the area expanded and expanded, uh, the relationship between the settlers and the, and the Indians continued to be peaceful. They lived in harmony with each other. Uh, of course, these settlers were, were French Canadians who had migrated south with their families. Uh, and Kaskaskia will become the region's leading shipping port of the Mississippi River until St. Louis was founded. Then in 1720, um, oh, and this uh, I think is important to note because it shows how small the British colonies were just clinging to the Atlantic 
and how large the territory was that France actually claimed. And also, all of the little star symbols represent forts. So you see that all throughout the French territory. You don't see that in the British colonies at all. There were no British forts uh, in the British colonies. So uh, that, that form of development was very different between the two peoples. Uh, and the Spanish would, would uh, create forts. But the British didn't uh, because they were there for various and sundry different reasons. So in 1720, this is what um, the French territory looked like. And that's when Fort Duchart would be created. So they, they sent a military presence up from New Orleans to create a uh, military presence there. And uh, in 721, Illinois became one of nine military districts in Louisiana. Uh, French settlers moved into farm and exploit the lead mines. Uh, on the Missouri side of the river. This would also be the introduction of slavery into the Illinois country, because part of this grant to, uh, to create the lead mines brought 100 slaves to the Illinois country, mostly from what is now Haiti, would have been French, Santo Domingo. Uh, so those 100 slaves were brought. That number, it, it varies depending on who you're reading, some say 250. I like to use the lower number of 100. I think that's probably a little more realistic um, as far as the number of slaves that they brought with them. Um, so because of Jesuit mission and the French population, um, the Kaskaskia and the, another native group here was called the Michigamia uh, tribes, uh, soon became heavily Catholic and they intermarried with the French. Who were these young French soldiers going to marry? Not many women around. So they married the Native American things. Um, and that would be another difference between the French and the British. English uh, colonists never intermarried with Native American women, uh, but the French did. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning, Kaskaskia was a multicultural village, just as St. Louis would be as it, as it starts to grow up consisting of a few French men, uh, numerous Illinois and other American Indians, and settlers from French Canada. So by 1707, the population of the community was 2,200. That's really big for New France, considering the whole population was going to be 50,000 uh, within a few years. Uh, so right in Kaskaskia about 1715, a visitor said the village consisted of 400 Illinois men, two Jesuit missionaries, and about 20 French voyeurs who have settled there and married Indian women. Of the 21 children whose birth and baptisms was recorded in Kaskaskia, 18 mothers were Indian and 20 fathers were French. Uh, one devout Catholic, full-blooded Indian woman disowned her half-breed son for living among the savage nation. She called the French the savages. Uh, as uh, she always would refer to them. Um, uh, in Upper Louisiana, though, uh, slaves were treated very differently than in the American colonies. They had a much larger uh, degree of freedom, and they were governed by something that the French called the Code Noir, which was written in Paris, and that all French settlers respected. Uh, Compared to American colonies, it was extremely liberal, if you can say that, in terms of, of slavery. But uh, the, they, uh, slaves were to be baptized. They were to be Catholic. They were to be taught to read and write. Uh, the Code Noir says that they are equal to all people, unlike Americans who designated them as property or real estate. Uh, and the ultimate objective, especially as the Spanish who were even more liberal, was to have a gain of freedom. So when they encountered American slavery, when they brought their slaves from Virginia, it was a, an eye-opener to these French people how their slaves were treated uh, under that system. So um, although the, the river villages were farming, again, it was the fur trade. That's why people were there. They had kept food to eat, but 
the money would come from the fur trade. So these uh, voyeurs from Cahokia and Kaskaskia began traveling up the Missouri River. Um, actually, by the time of the uh, of the arrival of Pierre Laclede, one historian I just read said that the Illinois country was totally played out. Uh, they had cut down so many trees uh, that there were no acorns left. If there are acorns, the deer can't eat. If you don't have deer, you don't have hides. So the deer were actually swimming across the Mississippi River to Missouri from the West Bank because they had no source of food. So, so the French moving across the river was, was almost out of necessity because they had played out the land uh, where they were living. And they needed a new source uh, on which to farm. So uh, that was one of the environmental consequences um, of populating the area. And then, of course, uh, they had to move across the river to St. Genevieve, which was founded in 1750. Because as you had your eight children, uh, let's say four of them are boys, those four boys have to have their land. And then their, their children have to have land. So you have to keep moving to acquire all this land for the future generations. So St. Genevieve was founded because of the overflow from the east side of the river. You give their children and grandchildren land on which they could farm. Of course, you know, the first place they chose was awful. And it was actually flooded and destroyed. And they actually called their settlement Miseray. Because it was so miserable to live over here. Uh, so most of the original inhabitants were again as French Canadians. Uh, the 1752 uh, census of St. Genevieve showed a population of 23 people. Uh, nine property owners with their families and slaves. Uh, so they were the first official non-Indian residents in Missouri as a result. But 20 years later, their population was still only 691 at the beginning of the French and Indian War. Uh, so that's the French settlement of this area. Now I'm going to switch to the English and begin to compare and contrast them a little bit more. So oh, that's a painting that I found of the original old St. Genevieve. So in 1750, before it was flooded out, that's what it would have looked like. OK, British Columbia will be that All right. Um, the English used a somewhat similar format in the beginning. The French had established a company in New France, a stock investment company. That's what the British did as well. Uh, so the, the Virginia Company was a joint stock company. Uh, people in London invested in this company. And almost every aristocrat in Britain invested in it. This was the new wave of get rich quick. Uh, they were going to invest in this company. They were going to go there, find mountains of gold, like the Spanish had done, and everybody would become enormously wealthy, including the king, who would get 20% of everything found. So um, people were more than willing to invest in this company. So in 1606, uh, the first ship left London, uh, not with the idea of establishing settlement. They were not there to colonize. They were there to find gold, like the Spanish had done, and then get rich quick and go back to England. So the first ship was all men. They never came as families. They were never there to create a new life. They were just there to find gold. Uh, the Virginia Company was actually split into two groups. There was the Virginia Company of London, which would get Virginia. And again, the king would just say, you have all the land that this latitude and this latitude from sea to sea. It's, it's. So that's why Virginia is claiming everything to the Mississippi River. Kentucky would be a part of Virginia. Uh, they didn't know what the country was like, but he just said from sea to sea. Yeah. That's what they want. Uh, and he did this with every colony that he gave to uh, a group that would say this latitude to this from sea to sea. So there would be tremendous uh, property disputes among the original Virginia colonies. Then there was a second company farm called the Virginia Company of Plymouth because they knew about these rich fishing grounds up there. Um, and when you look at the map of the two, they do overlap. This was to be a no man's land, which nobody knew. 
the space in between here and here. So a Virginia company would be this, and a Plymouth company would be that. Um, <coughs> so the first ship went to the Virginia Territory that left uh, London. And the overall management, though, of the colony would reside in England. It would not be in the colony. Well, not even the colony. It would not be there. Um, so there would be a 13-member council appointed by the king who would oversee anything that was found here and make sure that all the riches were distributed to the appropriate people. Uh, but the charter did do something very different than the French charters were. They gave control to a local council in the area who would enact the laws that would govern the people in the area. So they gave local control to these men. That's why the idea when, when John Adams says during the Revolutionary War period, we have always governed ourselves, was true. From the very first ships that arrived in the American colonies, they were able to govern themselves, independent of London. London just wanted to oversee the riches. They didn't care what they were doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So they left that local control up to them. That would eventually lead to rebellion among the colonies. Um, of course, they didn't find any boat. They didn't find the passage. Um, so that very first ship carried 105 men. Uh, there were 14,000 Native Americans in the area when they arrived, uh, who were not as um, accommodating as the Algonquin and the Iroquois, uh, and were always very suspicious of the British, and never formed any close alliance with them. They didn't try and destroy these 105 men, but they must have 
the Virginia colony, and she has many descendants in the United States as a result of that one child. Woodrow Wilson's first wife is a 12th generation descendant of Pocahontas. Uh, so that one child created a lineage in this country as a result. Uh, so this was really the most momentous uh, development in the British colony. The discovery now of a cash crop. There would be a way that they could get rich. It wasn't going to be gold or silver, but it would be from these cash crops that they would introduce into their colonies. The first was tobacco. So it would become a one crop colony. That's all. And that was the problem with the British colonies. They all devoted their land to one crop. And it destroyed the land. So by uh, the time of, of Jefferson and Madison, Madison, the early 1800s, Virginia was played out. The land was spent. Tobacco was no longer productive. And what the Virginians did was they then sold their slaves south to Louisiana and Mississippi. And there was cotton growing land. And that's how they made their money off of their slaves, by selling them away. Uh, so uh, for a while, you know, tobacco was extremely popular for the English settlers. Every farmer in Virginia raised tobacco, whether you had an acre or you had five million acres. This was also another difference. Uh, colonization. Lord Fairfax was given by the English king five million acres in Virginia. I couldn't even imagine what five million acres was. So I looked up the size of the state. That's the size of Massachusetts. That's what one man is given, Lord Fairfax. That's how George Washington begins his career. He becomes a surveyor for Lord Fairfax to find out what he owns. So surveyors. Being a surveyor was a way to become wealthy because you also get part of the land that you survey. So that's how dark it was. That's another story. So, um, so by 1628, just 14 years later, they were shipping 1 million pounds a year of tobacco to London. This is how profitable uh, tobacco became for them. I, I thought this was interesting. King James blasted this, what he called the filthy novelty. He said it was a vile and stinking custom. It was loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, and dangerous to the lungs. People about lung cancer in 1600s. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> that they could, he could put all of that together and see how detrimental it would be. But it was all the rage in London. That's what this picture is. There were smoking pumps that developed in, in, uh, in London. Uh, and the, the British couldn't get enough of their tobacco. So uh, it became extremely uh, valuable for these colonists. But 1619 would be the year that would really change Virginia and set it on a 
service. So did these Africans. So the idea of slavery didn't really exist. They were considered indentured servants. They would have the same seven-year contract. At the end of seven years, they would be free, and they would be given land. So for a short period of time, there was a free black population in Virginia. But that would soon come to an end. Uh, of course, slavery had existed in uh, South America and the Caribbean for over 100 years at this point. Uh, because the first uh, slaves were, were brought out of Africa around 1500 to the Caribbean islands um, and to produce sugar cane. So, so these, these British colonists knew about the existence of slaves, but it had never existed in England. So it was something relatively foreign to them. But with the massive amount of labor that was needed to clear the land, of the trees and to build these plantations and farms and to grow this very labor-intensive crop of tobacco. It's very different than growing wheat. Wheat is not labor-intensive. Tobacco, rice, sugar cane are very labor-intensive crops. Uh, so clearing the land was beyond the ability of most settlers. Uh, so the, uh, the owners of the large estates had the money to buy labor. They could buy more indentured servants. Uh, and so at first the indentured servants were used, but after seven years they were free. So every seven years you had to replace your, your labor force. Uh, and then they became landowners themselves and now they were in competition with their farmer masters. So that system wasn't working so well. Uh, the high turnover in labor uh, was detrimental to people becoming extremely wealthy. And that's what these people were there for not just being small farmers. So they needed a permanent labor force. They always had very negative relationships with Native Americans, which they did enslave. Uh, the Indians did not live as slaves. They just died. Because Indian men didn't work. Indian men hunted. Women did all work. Uh, and now you expect me to grow something in the ground? I don't do that. You know? And the worst was they would send them to the Caribbean where they would die within a year in the sugar cane fields. Uh, so Indians didn't make good slaves uh, for that reason. But they were people of color. They weren't white like Englishmen with rights, like these indentured servants. Well, now we have another population of people of color. They're not Englishmen. They don't have any rights as Englishmen. We can now enslave them. And that's what they did. So they turned from being indentured servants to by uh, 1638, the first slave auction was held in Virginia. So about 20 years later. Uh, and it didn't take too long before the, the plantation owners were saying, well, we want these people to be slaves forever. We don't ever want them to be free. We don't want to lose our labor force. Uh, and unlike white indentured women, they could not work in the fields. A white indentured female servant could only work in the house. A black slave woman can work in the fields. So now you double your labor force as well. And they reproduce. So your, your labor force keeps growing, and they're never going to be free. They're always going to be yours. Uh, so it was the perfect solution in their eyes to create a permanent labor force by enslaving people who were not Englishmen and had no rights of uh, Englishmen. Uh, so, uh, Slavery existed in every colony in the Americas. This is not a southern phenomenon. Uh, Massachusetts was actually the first colony to legalize slavery, not Virginia. Uh, of course, the New England states never had the number of slaves that southern states, that southern colonies would have, because they didn't need them. They couldn't have big farms. The ground wasn't fertile enough. And these women all had eight to 16 children. So you had your built-in labor force. Uh, so you didn't need a lot to buy a lot of labor uh, in the New England colonies. But uh, the word slave was used for the first time in Virginia law in 1661, uh, when slavery was defined as hereditary. If your mother was a slave, you would be a slave. Contrary to English law, where the status of the individual is determined by the father, not the mother. So any slaves 
born of the master, by English law, should have been free men. But by Virginia law, were not, because they changed it. You always know who the mother is. You don't always know who the father is. So that way you could make sure that these people would remain slaves. Uh, it would be compulsory life servitude defined by skin color. So that was the beginning of black slavery in the Virginia colonies. Very different than, than uh, following the code of the war that the French would follow. And after that, uh, all southern states would write their own slave codes, which would be, uh, which would control the number of their slaves. Uh, they couldn't be taught to read right. They, if they, they couldn't be manumitted. Uh, Virginia passed a law in the 1700s that said you could not free your slaves. They finally did amend it somewhat, um, and they said if you free the slave, you had to leave the state. So that's why some historians say Thomas Jefferson never freed Sally Hemings, because if he would have done that, she would have had to leave Virginia, which meant she would have had to leave her children. So, um, Freeing your slaves and then being free were two very different things in, uh, in American colonies. They never really could be free. Um, so that's how the southern states began to develop. The northern, uh, New England states would develop very differently. Uh, and this would be based on what uh, is now called radical Protestantism. Uh, when Columbus sailed uh, for uh, West in 1492, all of Europe was still Catholic. It would split 25 years later, in 1517, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 pieces to the door of the church in Wurttemberg. Um, the reform movement caught fire in Europe. Uh, and one of the most popular uh, Protestant reformers was John Calvin, who was a French theologian, but had to flee France and live in Geneva. Oh, that's another difference between the French and the English settlers. Uh, the French would not allow any French Huguenots to live in New France. No French Protestants were allowed to live there. So that's why they came to the American colonies to live, because uh, they were not allowed to live there. And the French and the Spanish, when they took over St. Louis, you had to sign a document that said that you were Catholic. Uh, Catholics were never welcomed to the British colonies. That would be another big difference between the two. And probably one of the greatest fears that these uh, French settlers of St. Louis had was now a people were going to govern them who hated Catholics. And what would that do to their religion? Uh, so that was a big fear that they had. Um, so um, uh, as soon groups began developing in every country, the Scottish Presbyterians, the German and Dutch Reformed churches, uh, and these people in England. Now, they never called themselves Puritans. That's a word that historians give to them. And Pilgrims and Puritans are two different people. They are not the same. We use that term generically. They're not the same people. Uh, so the, uh, uh, in 1567, uh, a small group of uh, what they call the separatists was found meeting in London uh, and, and worshiping in the Calvinist style. And that was contrary to the Church of England. Uh, even though England had become a, quote, Protestant country, the Church of England looked exactly like the Catholic Church. The only difference was they were controlled by the King of England, and the Catholic Church was controlled by the Pope. But other than that, the form of service was almost virtually the same. That's why I always say that Episcopalians are um, Catholics who, whose priests can get married. Uh, so that was basically the difference in the Church of England and, and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but by 1600, uh, there was a group of these uh, separatists who were much more radical. And these people called, uh, we call today pilgrims, they would call themselves that. Uh, uh, they refused to attend the state church, the Church of England. Uh, they wanted no ecclesiastical hierarchy. They refused to pay their tax to the church every year. So they were in violation of the law because they would not participate in the Church of England. They wanted to choose their own pastors. They wanted to, uh, 
a, a religion that would be a rule of life. What they were looking for was God's intention on earth, not what a, a group of priests was telling them that they should or should not do. So in 1606, uh, a group of them from a, a little town in England called Scrooby decided they could no longer live in the They were being persecuted. They, they had to support a church they did not believe in, so they left and they went to Holland. Uh, the Dutch were very um, open to religion. They allowed them to practice uh, their religious beliefs without any interference. But after uh, a generation or so, they began to see that their children wanted to marry Dutch people. And if they married Dutch people, maybe they wouldn't be as adherent to their religion. So they said, we've got to get out of here. Uh, we've got to go to a place where we can be so isolated that our children will be safe and we can raise them in our religious traditions. So they contacted again one of these trading companies in London, who was about ready to mount an expedition to go to uh, New England, and they boarded those ships uh, when they uh, came to London. They came there to pick them up. So of the people on the Mayflower, uh, there were 102 passengers. Only 41 of them were killed. The others were what they called strangers. They called themselves saints. They called people who were not of their faith strangers. But the strangers outnumbered the saints on the ship. Uh, and so uh, as they got closer to uh, their final destination, they decided, we better write a document to govern ourselves because we have all these heretics among us. So they wrote the name of our comment as a way of governing themselves. So from the very beginning, they had their own form of government. And Plymouth was a colony unto itself. It was not a part of Massachusetts Bay colony. It was a separate colony. Um, and they remained independent until 1691. So this is what Plymouth Colony looked like uh, at that time. And this is where they found all the bones of the Indians on the ground because they first landed here. Then they had to make their way around here and they finally discovered this spot that they made their colony. But uh, that was the extent of the Plymouth colony until 1691. Then they would be absorbed into Massachusetts after that time period because they needed protection from the Indians, so they merged. Um, Massachusetts Bay Colony was very different than that Plymouth. Um, the Puritans, and this is probably we call it Cromwell, <laughs> uh, uh, were very prominent wealthy people in England. They adhered to the Church of England. They just wanted to purify it. They wanted to get rid of what they called popis, the popishness of the Church of England. Uh, and so they wanted to purify their church. But they wanted to do it within the church, not separate like the Pilgrims did. Um, the word Puritan was actually used to identify a party within the Church of England. That's where the term comes from. It is not a religious belief. Uh, most Puritans would uh, either adhere to the Congregationalist Church or the Presbyterian Church. Those are the only two churches allowed in Massachusetts State uh, College. Eventually, uh, religious denominations would develop elsewhere, like the Baptist and the Methodist. Uh, the one group of people that was never allowed in Massachusetts Bay were Quakers. Quakers were the most hated religious group because they defied all authority. Quakers say everybody is equal. Men and women, rich or poor, king or servant. You're no better than I am because you're the king of England. So they wouldn't recognize any of our so everybody wanted to get rid of their Quakers because they were just, they wouldn't adhere to the law. Uh, so in Massachusetts Bay Colony, they would be whipped out, they would be hung. There was no religious colonists in Massachusetts Bay Colony at all. Um, so um, in 1629, uh, the things became, became so bad within uh, the Church of England uh, and these people were so vocal. They were very prominent people in the English society. This was not, you know, some poor, scum people. These were very prominent members 
of Parliament. Uh, the king decided he had enough and he wanted to deliver. So John Winthrop, who was a Puritan, came to him, asked the king for a royal charter. The king was more than happy to get rid of them. And so they, they just whole villages just, just took up lock, stock, and barrel, house, animals, everything, and moved to what would become Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, they would be completely independently governed. They would never have any consul in Europe that would, that would govern them in London government. So from the very minute, as John Adams said, they governed themselves when they reached the colonies. Uh, in 1630, uh, the first ship arrived, and carried, uh, there were 11 ships with 1,000 Puritans on board. All of their equipment, their livestock, and 10,000 barrels of beer. Uh, with their beer on board. Uh, the idea that the Puritans were against drinking is completely false. Uh, they, they believed in certainly in drinking, but in moderation. Not in drunkenness, but certainly. And they brought their beer with them. Um, and this will begin the great migration. Oh, and again, this is how confusing everything was. Okay, this is the Massachusetts Bay Colony Grant. But oh, look at New York says they own it. And then we have a little problem down uh, here with Pennsylvania. And Maine is just kind of hanging out there by itself. And so these land grants were overlapped with each other that the king would, would give to these groups. Uh, so that was what the Massachusetts Bay Colony Grant would look like. Again, it would come all the way through Chicago. That's how far it would extend from coast to coast. Uh, so that was the extent of the uh, land grant that they were given. Um, but it would start what we call what the Puritans would call the Great Migration. Now they all wanted to leave England. They wanted to live in a, a country where their religious beliefs were dominant, not they didn't have, want to be a part of the Church of England. Uh, so they began leaving in England in droves. Now they didn't all come to New England. A great many went to the uh, Caribbean islands. And some even went to that uh, colony on the Chesapeake, 5,000 of them. Uh, but about half did end up going to New England. So there was a mass exodus from England during this time period. And uh, some of them would go back once uh, Cromwell uh, took control of the English government. Many of these settlers went back to England because they now thought England would be ruled by their Puritan beliefs until they brought them came back again. Uh, so, um, this was a major influx of people. This is more people than would ever live in the, the French colonial area in this one, this one religious group coming to, this is, this is almost 50,000 people. Uh, and of course, they reproduce like rats. I said, eight to, eight to 15 children was the norm for a woman at this time. And what's unbelievable is these children lived because it was so much healthier for them to live in the new world they had vegetables, they had fruit, they had meat, things that they couldn't have in Europe, especially meat, very hard to come by in England and in France. Uh, so <coughs> the diets became much better. And they were amazed at how big the Native American people were. They were an inch or two taller than Europeans at this time, uh, even Indian women. And th that was one interesting thing about the Osage. The average height of an Osage man was six two to seven feet. So the average height of a French one was five feet. So you can imagine the concrete we so, uh, But there's one one drawing of a sage man. And he has a seven foot lance in his hand, in his hand and that's the height that he is. So they were a very big people, very tall people, um, and the Europeans were not in comparison to them. But because of these healthy diets. These children didn't die, you know, and they weren't living in, in cities where uh, disease would spread like wildfire. So uh, that's why most of their children didn't survive. Uh, so that, that was, again, something very different than their European experience. 
So um, again, like Virginia, they quickly set up their own form of government. It was called the General Court. Uh, and it was a, a colony ruled by a Puritan oligarchy and was characterized by absolute intolerance of anybody different than them. It would have ended in the Salem witch trials where they killed 19 of their own people uh, as a result of this hysteria. So by the end of the 17th century, uh, between King Philip's War and uh, Salem witch trials, the English king had had enough and he took the colony away from them. And it became a royal colony, which would now have a royal, non-Puritan government, which would now mean the state religion was the Church of England. So what they thought they were getting away from within less than 100 years was right back. Now, the Church of England would never be uh, a large part of Massachusetts culture, but there was a church there. Uh, that they had to look at it, uh, and and uh, and did have to pay taxes to. So uh, the next two colonies that did up, oh, and where these people came from is interesting. Almost all the Puritans come from the east coast of England. Uh, so that's where they were primarily living at the time that they left the country. Uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut would break away from Massachusetts. Uh, they would be founded by men who could no longer stand the religious intolerance of the congregation. Sir Roger Williams would be kicked out of Massachusetts and on the verge of being hung uh, when he was able to escape, and he would found uh, Rhode Island. Uh, and Rhode Island quickly became a haven for Quakers and Baptists. They were welcomed there. But uh, in the uh, charter, uh, the charter that they wrote, it says distinctly, Roman Catholics shall not enjoy the rights of free men. So they were not allowed to vote. They were not allowed to own land. They could live there, but they had no rights at all. And that was the basic attitude of almost every American colony. Um, so this was not a place where Catholics ever wanted to come and live. They went to New France, where they were welcome uh, because of their religious beliefs. Uh, the same thing would happen in Connecticut. Another uh, uh, minister would break away from uh, the church in Massachusetts and found his own colony of Connecticut. But what's interesting about Connecticut was their uh, constitution was called the Fundamental Articles. And this is the definition of their government. A governor could not serve two consecutive terms, and uh, there would be no religious test required for citizenship. Uh, it created a general court with legislative, judicial, and administrative powers, and it provided for a representative government. No mention was ever made of allegiance to the king. This is our constitution that we have today. So it was written in Connecticut. That was the form that they would eventually use. Uh, so it really became the prototype uh, that they would use at the constitutional convention. Um, so that constitution existed for over 180 years in Connecticut. So the beginning of constitution writing comes into, into the American colonial experience, which the French had no need for because they didn't have to be governed by these rigid laws. The, the communities just weren't big enough to ever need that. And now these Americans were going to descend on St. Louis with their lawyers and their judges. And they, the French wanted no part of that at all. Like one French would say, I'm going to have to serve on jury duty. Why in God's name would I ever want to do that? <laughs> you know, they just saw no need for any kind of governmental structure at all. Uh, the next colony would be Maryland. And now totally different than Virginia or Massachusetts. These were not owned by Scotland. Maryland was given to one man. This would be a proprietary colony. And this one man was given total control of that colony. He would be the king of that colony, in essence. Uh, he decided who got the land. He wrote the laws. He administered everything in that colony. And that was George Calvert. Uh, George Calvert was uh, Secretary of State under uh, James I of England. But he converted to Catholicism because his wife was Catholic. 
so he could no longer be in James Court. No Catholic could have any kind of uh, position in the English government. Uh, so uh, under James I, there was sweeping uh, reform against the Catholics in England. So because of this, Calvin lost his office. But James liked him very much. And so he gets said, I'm going to give you 7 million acres of land north of the Potomac River. You go there, you take your Catholics with you, and you start your own colony. Lord Calvert himself never came to the New World, but he sent his son, uh, he, uh, two of his sons, who would administer. Uh, James also granted uh, uh, Calvert a title. Uh, he became Lord Baltimore which is an Irish barony. So now he owned land in Ireland, as well as this American colony. Um, and they said he had complete control over the colony, all branches of government. Uh, he could coin his own money. Uh, he could farm his own army. Uh, he could pardon criminals. He could establish courts. He could make war. So he had every power that the king of England had, as did his son. Um, it's kind of a misperception to think of Maryland as a colony completely dominated by Catholics. It wasn't. Only some very wealthy, aristocratic Catholic families came to Maryland. But what they brought with them were their indentured servants, who were all Protestants. So there was a very small Catholic minority, but they were the first colony to write a, a statute regarding religion. And it said that people could practice any religion they wanted in this colony, unlike Massachusetts, uh, or unlike Virginia, which supported the Church of England. And Maryland was the first colony to uh, have this idea of religious toleration. But Calvert even told his uh, Catholic uh, aristocrats who came with him, he said, keep everything very simple. Keep your religion very quiet. Don't make a big deal of it. I don't want to see any cathedrals here. Very simple churches. We don't want to make our presence that well known. So even they felt they had to sort of hide from the, the Protestant uh, settlers in Maryland. But it would be the first time in colonial history uh, that a law would be written that would allow men to worship God according to their conscience. So this is where a lot of the French Huguenots came. They came to Maryland because they were both from there. First of all, they were Protestants. Uh, they would also go to, uh, uh, to North Carolina as well. Uh, Carolina was another uh, proprietary colony, but this was given to eight English lords from Barbados. At this time, Barbados, which is circled here right down here, was uh, one of the wealthiest sugar islands in the Caribbean. But it was overpopulated. Everybody wanted to be here. There wasn't any more land available. so. Uh, the king gave uh, this grant of land to these eight lords, and they established their colony. In what was called Carolina, it was one colony. It was not North and South Carolina. Eventually, the two would become so contentious that the king would, would break them apart from each other. They didn't bring sugar cane with them. What they found they could grow there was rice. And the rice arrived on a ship from Africa. And it was a strand of rice called gold rice. And it was worth its weight in gold. The, uh, the uh, uh, colony actually gave the ship's captain 100 pounds as a reward for bringing in this rice. So uh, they converted their slaves that they brought from Barbados to grow sugar cane into growing rice. And they brought with them uh, the most vicious form of slavery from the Caribbean. Uh, so they brought a new level of violence into the slave community because that's where they handled their slaves in the Caribbean. Uh, so a small ruling class of plantation owners would control the colony. There would never be any House of Burgesses in Carolina. Uh, these eight men would rule this colony. Uh, so by 1760, the population of Carolina was 150,000. Three fourths of the most slaves. Even by the time of the Civil War, uh, South Carolina's population would be half white and half black. 
uh, stuff, uh, they had the largest uh, percentage of slaves. Virginia had the largest number, but Carolina had the largest percentage. Uh, so uh, the, the next colony is New York, and again, they took that away from the Dutch and uh, gave it, and uh, he gave, Charles gave it to his brother, the Duke of York, thus the name New York, and from that they would spin off uh, New Jersey. And the Dutch had introduced slavery to their colony of New Amsterdam, being the largest trader of slaves in the world. Uh, every patron who got land along the Hudson River also got eight slaves with his land. And they were given 16 miles of land along the Hudson River and as far inland as they wanted to go. So these were huge plantations. This is where uh, uh, the Roosevelt's were coming. FDR's uh, ancestors would be one of these patrons who got this land along the Hudson River. Um, Pennsylvania was a little different uh, in that uh, this was land again given to one person, William Penn, to get the Quakers out of England. And that's what he did. Uh, the king was in debt to his father, 16,000 pounds at the time, to pay off the debt. He gave uh, uh, Lord uh, Penn this land. This is bigger than the country of England. That's how much land William Penn, Penn is given. So now we have Lord Fairfax in Virginia, we have William Penn, with estates that are actually bigger than their native country. Uh, but that's how vast these uh, claims were that these men were given. One interesting thing about the development of Pennsylvania, yeah. Uh, you see, this is color coded to um, where people came from. So the English are this kind of yellow color. This reddish, this color is Scotch Irish here in Western Pennsylvania. These would be the men who would start distilling whiskey in the United States because they, they made whiskey in Scotland. Scotch Irish does not mean that they're Irish. These are people from Scotland that Queen Elizabeth moved to Northern Ireland to, uh, to take over the land from the Catholics who lived there. Uh, and so they were Scottish people living in Ireland. So that's why Northern Ireland today is Protestant and Southern Ireland is Catholic. They came from the Scottish people. Uh, but for various and sundry reasons, they decided to leave their native land and they moved into Western Pennsylvania. These were really renegade people. Uh, they didn't buy land, they didn't. They didn't bother to register land, they just squatted. Uh, and if you came with your land claim and said, this is my land, they shot you. So, uh, a real sort of wild west mentality that would develop uh, in western Pennsylvania as a result. Now this is a different group. This is where the Scottish Highlanders, after the Battle of Kalan, would congregate in the highlands of North Carolina. So these are a different group. And, and a lot of these people were Catholic, uh, the Scottish Highlanders. So the Scots, Irish, and the Highlanders are two different groups of people. Pennsylvania was probably the most diverse. There was a large colony of Germans that also lived in Pennsylvania. Uh, so it was very different than all the other colonies uh, because of the people there was a large Swedish population in Pennsylvania and New Jersey as well. Um, and and uh, the largest city in the colonies would be Philadelphia. They would not be New York City, that's way down the road, so it's Boston. Uh, so Philadelphia was the major city. Uh, and of course, the last colony uh, to be founded was Georgia, and this is again completely different. Uh, Georgia was founded by uh, a man by the name of Oval Park, who uh, wanted to use Georgia as a social experiment. He said, give me all the people who are in debtor's prison. They shouldn't be in debtor's prison. Why should you put them in jail? Just because they owe money. They can't pay it back then. So give them to me. I'll take them to the new world start a college. So this kind of predates Australia. Uh, so so, uh, so uh, Georgia was founded as a social experiment to see if these convicts could become uh, productive citizens. 
the world. And they certainly did. And also to get buffer between Spanish Florida and Carolina. That was a little reason. So uh, while these French villages were growing up along the Mississippi Valley and the British were colonizing the Atlantic seaboard, a series of wars between France and England would bring the two groups finally together. Uh, and the first of these is not the French and Indian War. That's actually the third. Uh, again, another interesting thing about this is all of these little symbols are missions. So you notice again the difference in the colonization of, uh, of New Spain. Louisiana has all the forts, and the American colonies, none of those things. Uh, and how small the American colonies were compared to the French and the Spanish. Uh, it's interesting, when, uh, when the uh, Louisiana Purchase was made, Livingston asked Calderman, he said, well, what are the borders? What do we own here? Calderman said, I don't know. You figure it out when you get there. They had no idea what they owned. They were just buying something. But they had no idea what the Louisiana Purchase was. So again, Spain then and France would overlap in that way, too. Uh, so, uh, the first of these was actually King William's War. Uh, that was 1688 to 97. These were also wars being fought in France and Spain. They just also happened to come over to the New York. So this is called the Nine Years War in, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, the English and the Iroquois would form an alliance and attack in France. Uh, they thwarted uh, New England expansion into Acadia at this time. Uh, when King William's War ended in 1697, another was fought, Queen Anne's War, which in Europe is called the War of Spanish Succession, uh, for nine years, 1702 to 13. And uh, Quebec again survived English invasions. Uh, but during the wars, France seized many of the English Hudson Bay Company fur trade as a result of this war. Uh, and then the, the, the final conflict would be the French and Indian War in Europe called the Seven Years' War. This is the world's first world war because now the British Empire is so large, the French Empire is so large, there are the uh, Americas. This war was fought literally around the world. But it started in Ohio, on the Ohio River, by George Washington. Uh, so George Washington actually was known about the war at this time as the man who started this war uh, between the French and actually the Virginia militia uh, that the, the English army at that time. Um, so uh, Fort Duquesne at the mouth of the Allegheny and the Monongahela was critical because this would control the Ohio River, then the Mississippi, then the fur trade. So that's why it was such a, a, an important and the Virginians wanted to take it away from the French. Um, there was very little involvement from Fort de Chart in the war. Uh, they did send 300 Illinois uh, warriors, Illinois Indians, to fight at Fort Cess. And they did send some supplies. But other than that, they had no military involvement in the, uh, in the war. So in 1759, Quebec fell. And that was the end of the French in North America. Uh, Montreal surrendered the following summer, uh, and British soldiers occupied forts uh, along the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley. And Fort de Chart and the Illinois country would remain under French control until October of 1765. But the one thing about the Treaty of Paris that is interesting for the French settlers here was. Yes, all of this land became part of the British colony. But George III drew a line down the Appalachian Mountains. It's called the Proclamation Line. And he said no uh, British colonists could go west of this line. So the French were safe. Because, not, not that they listened to anything that the English had said, but by this law, this was to remain what he called the Indian Reserve. And this land would be a buffer between the British and, of course, very quickly, the Spanish. Um, and he didn't want any colonization 
he didn't want any more conflict with the Native Americans. So, you know, little did he know that people from Virginia had already claimed all of this land. George Washington owned 20,000 acres in New York. And the French and the uh, English king took it away from him. That's what turned him into a rebel. Was how could the king of England take his land away from him as a British colonist? Uh, so, so until uh, the War of Independence, the little French settlements along the river, in essence, were safe because the Americans were told they can't go. And so there weren't many. Uh, they would continue to move into Ohio illegally, uh, but the French, in essence, were safe. Uh, and as Madame Chouteau, you know, talked about, uh, they were safe from these heretic problems. They didn't want these heretic Protestants with their lawyers and their, their courts, and worst of all, the thing they needed the most, land speculators. They didn't buy land. They were given land. None of these Americans were going to take over all this land and try to sell it. Uh, so those were the things that they hated most about this encroachment of, uh, of British and Americans into their land. But they would have a reprieve uh, until 1783. Uh, and then the Americans would be able to get this territory in very large numbers. Why then they all take over So that's the end. Channel 7 and 98 TV and web broadcasting are made possible through contributions and donations from viewers like you. Thank you for your support.